Hello, fellow Rebel Capitals. Hope you're well. Wanted to go over some recent news that just came out about a secret meeting, well, semi-secret meeting, with the United States, Japan, and South Korea. I think you're going to find this fascinating. Let's go right over to the Wall Street Journal, and I'll show you what I am referring to specifically. You might have gotten a hint from the thumbnail. But we go over to this article, China pledges to steady yuan as Asian currencies come under pressure. Okay, so this was more about China, but I want to focus on this meeting and the other Asian currencies, because I think that tells the story. Asian currencies have been weighed by a flurry of headwinds this year, but it's not just the Asian currencies. <laughs> well, let's be honest. It's pretty much every single currency out there. And it's not just that the currencies are experiencing a lot of downward pressure. They're experiencing a lot of downward pressure relative to the dollar. The dollar wrecking ball, if you will. So let's get back to this article. This is spearheaded by the U.S. dollar strength due to fading expectations. Okay, well... It, they're talking about interest rate differentials. Maybe, maybe not. We're going to get to that more. Uh, I think it's more how the monetary system is structured. More on that in just a moment. Uh, then they also contribute a lot of domestic pressures. The widespread depreciation has sparked concerns among officials in various countries. In a joint statement released Wednesday, the finance minister of Japan, South Korea, and U.S. acknowledged serious concerns from Tokyo and Seoul over their respective currencies. Recent sharp weakness. The finance ministers said after their first, now get this guys, their first trilateral meeting in Washington, D.C. So it's not like they're just sitting there talking over Skype or talking over the phone. The, the stuff is hitting the fan. And that is not an exaggeration. Outside of the United States, the, the stuff is hitting the fan. And so they're desperate. So they're flying to Washington, D.C. to meet with Janet Yellen and say, look, we need help. We need help. We have to do something. Or the dollar is going to crush our economies. And we're going to get into why the dynamics that are at play behind the scenes in just a moment. So they said they'll continue to consult closely on foreign exchange market developments. And Zero Hedge is calling this Plaza Accord light. And I think where this leads, I've been saying this for well over a year, the end game here is Plaza Accord 2.0. And this is why I say in my videos and uh, more recently presentations, live presentations that I've done, where the, the, the risk with the dollar crashing is not that the dollar crashes down, but that it crashes up. In other words, the tail risk of the dollar is not to the downside. It's to the upside. Getting back to the article, the statement came as the greenback rose this week to its highest intraday levels against the yen since June of 1990. And it's highest since... Uh, against the won, the South Korean won, since November of 2022. Here's a quote. The central banks want to prevent the exchange rate from overshooting. Oh, <laughs> and I like how they say they always have to blame it on the market. Oh, well, the market just, boy, boy, they just really don't understand what the exchange rate should be. And therefore, the market is causing the exchange rate to be all out of whack based on the fundamentals. Therefore, we've got to intervene to make things right. And we've got to intervene to, uh, to create solutions for the mistakes that the market has created to begin with. <laughs> it's just, oh, it's just craziness looking at the world through the lens of the central planners and the authoritarians. But getting back to the article here, central banks around the world clearly want the currencies to take a breather from recent declines. The trilateral statement 
And again, that's key because I think this is telling us that they're not just independent of one another. Now they are uniting and coming together with a specific game plan that all of them are going to try to execute. Uh, very similar, almost, uh, you could argue the exact same thing they did with the Plaza Accord 1.0 in the mid-1980s. But it's not just the Japanese yen and the South Korean won. Check this out. Indonesia, Indonesia's, Indonesia, why oh, I can't say that, uh, rupiah, I think they just also call it the rupee, uh, like the Indian rupee, tumbled to around four-year lows versus the dollar this week, prompting the Bank of Indonesia to step in to counter the currency weakness. Uh, this May Bank analyst said in a recent note, Bank of Indonesia is reportedly coordinated with the government and stakeholders, like state-owned oil firm, to uphold currency stability. Malaysia, renowned weakness in the ringgit, prompted Bank of Malaysia to say this week that it will ensure sufficient liquidity and orderly function of Forex market. Thailand, the Thailand's bot, is also struggling, having tumbled over 7% versus the dollar year to date. That's likely causing, that's likely to be causing concern for central bank policymakers. OCBC senior economist, no way I'm going to get that one right, sorry, said in a note. So now let's shoot over to Zero Hedge, and this is what they're calling Plaza Accord Light. And, and quite frankly, I just call it a plaza or the precursor to what I think is inevitable. I don't think it's really a matter of if, it's just kind of a matter of when, and that's Plaza Accord 2.0. So they start off talking about the, this dress the gal wore to the meeting. I, I mean, I'll, I'll let you decide whether or not that's appropriate because they're going to the White House to meet with like the the, the uh, representatives from Japan and South Korea, <laughs> like the finance ministers. So I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if that dress is too appropriate, but. Uh, Again, I'll, I'll let you be the judge. We said that even though, and they're talking, let's see who is writing this article, that would be Zero Hedge themselves. We said that even though the yen is plunging, it would be virtually impossible for the Japan's, for Japan's Ministry of Finance to step in and prop up the imploding currency. But, but again, it, it's not that it's imploding against goods and services. It's not like it's imploding in Japan. It's simply imploding against the dollar. And we need to make that distinction very, very important. However, now the Japanese state visit is long over the probability that Tokyo will step in and prop up the collapsing currency any given moment is soaring. I agree. But it's not just Japan. It's not just Korea. I mean, I just did a whiteboard video this morning, and I, I touched on it last night on a live stream, but I did the back of the napkin math on several major economies in the world. I'm just looking at the whiteboard right now. And to give you an idea of other countries whose currency is just tanking against the dollar to the point where, even though they've had local inflation, goods and services denominated in dollars have gotten cheaper. And like I said on Twitter the other day, this is one of the hardest things for the average American to get their head around. Because how many times have you, sir, have you heard, oh, George, well, this none of this matters because we all know that the dollar is just the cleanest shirt in the dirty clothes hamper, meaning that all the currencies are going down, but the dollar is going down slower. That is nonsense. That is not true. That is unequivocally false. And I think the reason why it's so hard for Americans to get their head around that is because they see the dollar going down in value relative to stuff that they can buy. And because they've grown up in the United States, they, they can't really fathom using another currency. But when you go to these other countries, having a multi-currency account is very common. In fact, when I was doing business overseas prior to retiring, I had a multi-currency account with HSBC in Hong Kong. And, and, Every entity did. 
Like I was just like, yeah, of course, you've got a multi-currency account. But in the United States, that's so rare. So I think for Americans, it, they just see the world through the lens of their experience. And in that world, if you live in currency X, you only, you only can use currency X. And if you live in country or economy Y, you can only use currency Y. Where if the, the way it works around the world outside of the United States is if you live in country Y, you can absolutely use uh, currency X. Why would you not? If that currency X is actually a store of value and increasing or at least maintaining its purchasing power over the last decade. So these countries include Brazil, where the dollar is way up, way up since 2012, even relative to local goods and services, which I can assure you is the only thing Brazilians care about, right? In fact, and I'm gonna be showing this clip from, uh, and this was not in one of the live streams from our Argentinian road trip that Josh and I went to, but the very first stop we made in Argentina when we crossed the borders in the, in the Andes going from Chile into Argentina, we stopped at a local uh, snack shop there where they were exchanging money. And, and I didn't know they were exchanging money, but they came. we came in, they could tell in two seconds that I was a gringo. So they asked me if I had any dollars that I would sell them for Argentinian, Argentinian pesos. I said, yeah, absolutely, I, I, I do. So we made the exchange. I say, why? I, I basically said, I can't remember exactly, so I'm paraphrasing. But in my broken Spanish, I, I tried to ask them why they were so proactive about asking me to sell them dollars. And what they said is it, they just, they didn't speak much English, but they kept taking the, the dollar in this hand and they kept saying oro, 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 oro. And oro in Spanish is gold. I'm not making this up, right? And, and so, so why is that? Because even though it's been a horrible store of value in the United States, outside the United States, it's been an incredible store of value for this reason because the dollar's been going up way faster than the price of the stuff that they have to buy daily, right? But anyway, getting back to this, we've got Brazil, the dollar's way up, Colombia, way up, Indonesia, way up, Germany, Italy, UK, India, pretty much flat to slightly down. And I'm talking about the last 12 years and Canada, dollar up. So those were just the countries that I looked into. And uh, those are some major economies right there. It's not like I'm just exclusively pointing out Turkey and Argentina or Nigeria, Zimbabwe, <laughs> or Venezuela or something like that. Okay, getting back to the article. We can see this chart of the Japanese yen and this going back to 1990. That, that's really quite unbelievable when you think about it now let's go over to well the georgegamma.com website and i think i talked about this on the channel a few times and i just never got around to giving you guys the url but i did this paper just to really kind of organize my thoughts on from a mechanic standpoint, why it's so difficult for the dollar to go down globally and why I thought the probability was highest that the dollar would crash up, not down. And I, I think I told you guys that I was going to give you the URL and we were going to use, use it as a lead magnet for our email list. And uh, Gene, my digital marketing guy, sent it to me and then I just forgot about it. <laughs> uh, so let me go back here and put it in the chat so you guys can check it. It's like an 11-page paper. And as you know, I, I really don't do papers all that often, but I might start doing a few more. I'm not that good at them, but it does really help me organize my, my thoughts. So Josh, did you see that link that I just put in the chat? 
if you want to also include that link in the comments uh, when we get done, I'd greatly appreciate it. And so anyway, let's go over there. You can just put in your email address and you'll get the whole paper. But I want to reference this one point in particular. So I've talked about the three things that foreigners can do if they want to de-dollarize. And uh, one of them was to go ahead and buy U.S. assets. And um, I, I realize that what we're talking about with this Plaza Accord 2.0 doesn't really involve the foreigners buying U.S. assets as of yet, although I think they're definitely going to be buying treasuries for sure. But this is more so uh, the mechanics at play if the inflation rate or if the United States, Jerome Powell, is worried about the inflation rate going higher in the U.S., this reflationary cycle, which I don't really buy into, but if the central planners do, that means that they could be holding rates longer or holding rates higher for longer or potentially even raising rates. So getting into this dynamic here, I'm going to read right from the paper. As a result, there's an undersupply of dollars outside of the U.S. relative to demand to pay debt and an oversupply inside the United States. So there's an oversupply inside the United States, and that's going to lead to uh, consumer price inflation pressures. Again, there's just one variable, multiple cross currents here. And then outside, we see all this U.S. debt, which represents demand for dollars, but we have a shortage of dollars. And if you sit there and say, George, what are you talking? What? What? A shortage of dollars? That's impossible. Look, don't shoot the messenger. Just look at the DXY. Just talk to the guy in Japan. Just talk to the guy in South Korea. Talk to the guy in Indonesia, Malaysia, Brazil, Colombia, Canada. The fact that those currencies are plummeting tell, that tells you that this is not George Gammon's opinion. This is fact. This is reality. There is a shortage of dollars outside of the United States. As, as unfathomable <laughs> is that it, as that is. It's the absolute truth. And I'd like to also point out, before we go any further, that you have to understand that this has all happened. As, and I use 2011, 2012, because I think the monetary system fundamentally changed during and after the GFC, which has led to these dynamics that we have seen play out where the dollar has not gone down uh, relative to goods and services in other countries. The dollar isn't losing value just at a slower pace. Now, in the United States, it is. But outside, it's, it's absolutely unequivocally not. And I think that the monetary system changing has a, a, a fundamentally, structurally, led to what we have seen. And I think that Again, getting back to the article here, or the paper, that's why you're most likely going to see, and there's variations. Obviously, there's a lot of volatility here. But in the future, the risk is dollar going up. But getting back to this, adding insult to injury, the maturity of the debt inside the U.S. is likely to be much longer. And the maturity of the debt outside of the United States, much shorter. And that matters a lot. Because if you've got to pay back a dollar-denominated loan in the next two weeks, you're going to be holding those dollars. You're going to be hoarding those dollars. That's a better way of saying it. Where in the United States, if they've got those dollars being created and circulating, where the majority of the debt, let's take note to an extreme, is a 30-year fixed-rate mortgage, see, the dollars have a lot more time to circulate. Because the undersupply outside of the United States and the shorter maturity of the debt, and again, we can't argue that there's an undersupply, that the, the prices of the currencies are telling us that there's an undersupply. So the odds are Jerome Powell raises rates or keeps rates uh, higher for longer uh, if we continue to see these inflationary pressures in the U.S., and I think that's a big if. My base case is they go down, and the U.S. has to lower rates, but all the other countries will probably lower rates even faster. As a result, even if the entities outside of the U.S. could roll over their debt, it'd be at much higher interest rates, making the debt burden even more overwhelming. And even if they're even if they're able to refinance the debt at lower interest rates, it doesn't matter if the dollar is going up to a greater degree relative to the currency that they have cash flow in. So here's kind of how it just breaks down this simple doom loop. The dollar shoots higher. 
Powell raises rates, the debt burden increases, and even if he doesn't raise rates, the debt burden still increases. And because the uh, debt burden increases, there are more dollars that are owed, right? Uh, this is if they increase rates, right? But let's skip to the next one because that's applicable even if they don't raise rates. And because of uh, the higher debt burden, what this means is you need more dollars, or excuse me, you need more of your local currency to buy the dollars you need to pay off the debt. And what does that do? That devalues your currency even more. And I know this is rather tough to follow. So let me give you another example here. You're Japan, you import oil. You have to import almost 100% of your oil. So if the price of oil is going from $70 a barrel up to $80, $85 a barrel, that in and of itself makes you spend way more on uh, using, in Japanese yen terms, uh, just to buy that barrel of oil. So let's just say that we start off with the Japanese with one Japanese yen buying one barrel of oil. Okay, then the price of oil goes up and doubles. Now all of a sudden you need two Japanese yen. Okay, but what happens is during that same time frame, the dollar increases in value relative to the yen. Now you don't just need two Japanese yen, even though the price of the oil only doubled. Now you might need three or maybe even four yen where just six months ago, you only needed one. And then you think, oh my gosh, George, isn't that going to cause massive inflation throughout Japan? No, quite the opposite. Because remember, if they're paying, if they were paying one, and I'm going to an extreme here, just so you understand the concept, and now they're paying four, well, they, what does that do to the rest of the aggregate demand? That's to pretty much spend every penny they're getting just to buy gas. Right. So that ironically, that could lead to even further deflation locally. While their currency is inflating to oblivion against the United States dollar, which ironically would make would give the dollar's purchasing power even more strength and would incentivize those Japanese savers to further save in dollars. Just like Argentina, those green pieces of paper effectively become gold to those individuals. And so now a lot of you right now are probably saying, well, George, what does this even matter? Who cares? I'm in the United States. And why this should really matter to you is because once you understand the incentives that are at play outside, worldwide, outside of the little bubble of the US economy, then you look at the dollar losing reserve currency through that lens. And I can assure you, you're going to come up with much different probabilities. Or if you look at the United States debt and you say like, this is unsustainable. This is unsustainable. Holy cow. I mean, in six months, the United States is going to have to spend hundred percent of their tax receipts just on interest. So the whole world sees that this is un unsustainable. So how can rates at the long end of the curve not explode higher? And then the 10 year treasury rates going to go up to 10, 15, 20%. And the Fed's not going to have a choice but to come in and buy all this debt, do yield curve control. And the only way they're going to buy that debt is by printing more currency units, by printing dollars. And that's going to make the dollar go down even faster, which is going to force all of these foreigners to sell even more dollars because they don't want this hot potato. You see? As you know, that's the argument. But that is an argument from someone that has never been outside the United States. <laughs> I'm not going to say, I shouldn't say that. That is an argument for someone that has a U.S. centric view. When you step back, you look at the data, it becomes crystal clear as to why there is a huge incentive for these foreigners to, to hold dollars and maybe even more importantly, to hold U.S. Treasuries, whether you like it or not. So now let's go over to
U.S. Treasury rates a 10-year. And because a lot of you are saying, well, they've gone up, they've gone up, which they absolutely have. But there's still 75 basis points, or uh, let's say 50, 60 basis points, under Fed funds. If I were to tell you right now, let's just say an alien comes down from outer space. And I say, right now, the 10-year Treasury is trading 50 basis points under Fed funds. Do you think the bond market is predicting reinflation? Or do you think the bond market is predicting a deflationary crash, hard landing recession, whatever you want to call it? Obviously, that alien is going to say, yeah, the bond market's predicting a deflationary crash, not predicting reflation. And just to give you some further context, let's look at the last time the 10 year treasury was right around this level. Oh, that would be 2007. And by the way, it was inverted. The curve was inverted back then as well. And I also want to point out that all of these dynamics have been at play while the M2 money supply in the United States has gone from $9 trillion, is right around 2011, to $20 trillion today. So in the last 12 years, M2 money supply in the United States has doubled, gone up by 100%. Let's look at the overall debt. It's gone from 14 trillion to $34 trillion. It's gone up by $20 trillion in the last 12 years. That's an increase of almost 150%. Think about what the Fed's balance sheet has done. It's gone from 800 billion all the way up to 9 trillion. Now, sure, it's down since then, but it hit a high. In fact, the high was over $9 trillion. And even though we've seen all of these things play out, the 10 year treasury yield is still trading at 4.6. Why is that? It's because of the way the monetary system is structured. And the way the monetary system is structured, whether we like it or not, it incentivizes, because of the price action, it incentivizes all of these foreigners to not only hold dollars, but to buy treasuries. Because why wouldn't you? I mean, you've got to think about it from a standpoint of someone in Japan, Brazil, Indonesia, Malaysia. Pick the country. You're sitting there seeing your currency uh, inflate or lose value relative to the dollar. And you're seeing the dollar go up in value relative to all the stuff that you have to buy. And you're like, man, it, why would I not hold treasuries and make an additional 5% on the 10 or 15% per year that I'm making just holding dollars instead of holding my local currency? Now you sit there and say, oh, George, but the dollar has lost value in the United States. But what you don't understand, foreigners don't care about the CPI in the United States. I'm sorry, they don't. They could care less that the CPI went to 9% in 2022. It doesn't impact them because they're not buying stuff in the United States. They don't care that the dollar has gone down relative to real estate. So what? The dollar has gone up relative to their local real estate. And last time most Japanese or Argentinians or Colombians or Indonesians checked, they're not trying to buy a house in the U.S. They're trying to buy a house in their local country. They're trying to buy groceries in their local country. They're trying to buy gas. They're trying to buy food. They're trying to buy these things daily, health insurance, send their kid to school in Indonesia, not in the United States. Let's see. And the reason I'm so adamant about this is because Americans just cannot get their head around this. And it's vitally important that they understand the mechanics, the dynamics out at play outside of the United States in order for them to make educated decisions about what the probabilities will be for the global economy and how to position their portfolio in the best way possible.
So main takeaway here, guys, is although the dollar could go down, you know, maybe to 100, maybe to 95, something like that, the path of least resistance is going to be going up, in my opinion. And again, there are no certainties. There are only probabilities. Uh, and this is based on the structure of the monetary system. If you want to read that paper, you can go and follow the link that, that Josh will put there and put in the description and in the comments. And you can go through that and understand my reasoning to uh, a, a very great degree, to a very detailed level. And uh, then you make your own decisions. But at least you know that those decisions will be well-informed. That's really the bottom line. All right, guys, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. As always, make sure that you're standing up for freedom, liberty, free market capitalism. We'll see you in the next video.